أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل العقدة من لساني يفقه قولي بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله على سيدنا وحبيب قلوبنا وشفيع نفوسنا أبا القاسم محمد الله محمد وعلى آل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين لا سيما بقية الله روحي وأرواح العالمين لتراب مقدمه الفداء أما بعد يقول الله في محكم كتابه الكريم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم فتلقى آدم من ربه كلمات فتاب عليه الله سبحانه وتعالى says within the holy Quran in surah al-Baqarah ayah number 37 that then Adam received from his Lord's kalimat and he accepted his repentance indeed. Sha'Allah utilizing this particular verse in question, using it as a platform for the final night that we gather together before the martyrdom of Abu Abdullah al Hussein, and bringing everything that we have endeavored to learn within these 10 nights and Amongst trying to apply it within our lives, we also want to take something of a conclusion to bring everything together to see how best to apply and the importance that we should take from Abu Abdullah and utilize from one Muharram towards the next. Because oftentimes we think to ourselves that Muharram, 10 days within the year, 10 days where I can connect with my Imam. 10 days where I have my full focus, that I remove everything that displeases Allah within my life, that I am able to, without hesitation, close and not work during the 10th. All these things become second nature, very easy for us to do. Why? Because it comes towards Abu Abdullah. I begin to understand Abu Abdullah al Hussein, not a seasonal thing. Imam al Hussein, once he has entered someone's heart, should always be there, not seasonal. You should carry that name from one Muharram towards the next. And at every stage of your calendar, you should be in that same aura, that same space that you have in the back of your mind that I am here today and have what I have because of the sacrifice of this man. The tragedy of Abu Abdullah, interestingly enough, when we analyze when it started and where it will end, because the question comes, who was the first person to shed a tear? For Abu Abdullah, and we often hear the tradition that when Rasulullah was given the glad tidings of a son that he calls Hussein, that upon putting that son within his embrace, Fatima al Zahra would see Rasulullah beginning to cry. Allahumma salli. Now, when Fatima sees this, she says towards her father, Oh, father, why do you cry? Is there something wrong with my child? And in which he tells her the story and the tragedy of Karbala. Now, many people, when asked, they say that this was the first majlis ever for Abu Abdullah al Hussein. We say, no, the, the realm of Abu Abdullah is much greater. Because we understand that Rasulullah mourned him before his death. He mourned him in his birth, before his death. But it wasn't the first tea that was shed for Abu Abdullah, nor the first majlis that was held. Majlis meaning the remembrance and having your heart connect towards Abu Abdullah. The verse in question that we brought forward at the start of tonight's lecture from Surah Al-Baqarah when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives Adam particular names, kalimat, when you go towards Bihar al-Anwar, the tradition that is given there to showcase to us what are these words that are given towards Adam. Your tr tradition comes forward and it says that Adam 
as passing by the throne of Allah or the manifestation sees these particular names. When he sees these particular names, Jibrail comes down. When Jibrail comes down, he begins to teach him these names. So he says, Oh Adam, repeat after me. He says, What should I repeat? He says, Ya Hamidu bihaqi Muhammad. Allahumma salli. Ya Ali bihaqi Ali, Ya Fatiru bihaqi Fatima. Wa Ya Muhsinu bihaqi al Hassan. And he repeats each and every one. And then he says, and say, Hussein wa minkal ihsan. So now let's look at the tradition. It says, Adam, after repeating everything of the words that he was given, an allocation to repeat after Jibrail, he says, Oh Jibrail, there's something I need to ask you. Jibrail says, What do you want to ask? He says, Oh Jibrail, when I mentioned the first four names, there is particular notion within me, an emotion that I felt strength, courage, happiness, and a sense of growth. He says, however, when I mention the fifth of these names, he says, I couldn't help myself. My heart all of a sudden had a pain like I've never felt, and I saw a tear drop from my eye. But I have no knowledge of why the heart hurt, nor the tea falling down my cheek. O oh, Jibrail, can you please tell me why this is? And Jibrail tells him, there will come a time where the grandson of the final messenger will be killed in a land known as Karbala Thirsty. First Majlis. Back then, when we go all the way back towards the first creation of Adam as the first prophet, and will the Majalis stop? They say, even after death, after death, my Mahdi would come to the end of it. Sallu alayhi. Allahumma sal. When Imam Mahdi would come, the Raj'ah would occur, the final, everything finishes, Qiyamah happens. You're thinking to yourself, if Qiyamah happens, and surely is there still Majalis for Abu Abdullah? How great is this man? The traditions tell us that amongst the first things to occur on the mahshar is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will tell those that are there in judgment day to all lower their gaze because on the mahshar is going to be walking none other than Fatima to Zahra. <laughs> when she arrives, they would say that a dome made of nur would be allocated for her which she sits under. And the person that comes across the mahshar is Aba Abdullah al Hussein holding his head in his hands in front of everyone to see. The tradition says that there is not a person that is a mu'min lest he cries, or an angel, or a believer, or a prophet of God, lest they weep upon what they see. Adam, throughout resurrection, Qiyamat, Hussein throughout. Now being part of that particular journey, you and I, we begin to understand just how powerful this message is. For us to be part of that journey and connection with Abu Abdullah, imagine how lucky we are. You know the tradition we mentioned at the start of the lecture where Rasulullah tells Fatima al-Zahra, this is what will occur to Hussein. She has the question that she asks him. Ya Rasulullah, tell me, who shall be with him? Who shall be with him in Karbala? He says, Ya Fatima, fi zamanin khalin minni wa minki wa min abi. There will be a time when he will be killed. That time will not have me, you or Ali alongside him. Then she says, after his martyrdom, who shall mourn over him? That's when the tradition comes that Allah will allocate men to mourn over his men. Women to mourn over his women. And he says, for those women that mourn over their women, you, O Fatima, will be an intercessor. And for those men that mourn over him during these days and nights, and remember his name year upon year, 
the shafi' for them will be none other than Rasulullah Muhammad. He says, I will be their intercessor. Look at the position that each and every one of us has. Now, understanding this faculty, what can we learn from this? The fact that, yes, it's an importance. But the second thing is, what can we take home from this? We know that we are part and parcel of this journey. Many of us will hold on to this rope of Aba Abdullah till our final breaths. Many of us will come through this journey of Aba Abdullah, maybe will not encompass the full message within our hearts. We may slip. Like we stated yesterday, we could be in the Akhirah in our mindset and maybe we'll end up back into the world. It depends if shaitan, we allow him to whisper and divert us or we have that world that we create through the faculty of Tawbah. Now understanding all these aspects and trying to detach from this world and attach towards the Akhirah, we go towards one particular position in Karbala to understand what we can take home. The position within Karbala is we want to look at the cry of Aba Abdullah in Karbala. The cry, because understandably, that flag that was held by Aba Fadl al Abbas indeed will be held by Imam Sahib al Asri wa Zaman. Allahumma When it's held by Imam Sahib al Asri wa Zaman, we need to understand. What are the similar principles that Abbas held the flag for that Sahib Zaman will hold? The same principles, what did Imam al Hussein scream out to the people? Will that call travel through time? Will that be the same call as Imam al Zaman or won't it? How important is for us to understand the cry of Abba Abdullah in Karbala? Because we want to be religious. We think to ourselves being religious is the only way through worship that we can get closer towards Allah. You know, the, the examples that were given, it doesn't matter how many rak'at that you pray. Never, it's never about how many rak'at you pray. It's always about the quality. You can have two rak'at. It can be greater than the worship of a person his entire life. Two rak'at, understanding, understanding those rak'at, understanding what your position is within Islam. How you are sinful, what you need to work on. Those two rak'ats in contemplation. You know when you go towards the khawarij. Just to give you an example of quality and quantity before we move on. And showcasing to everyone the knowledge of Amir al-Mu'mineen. We'll find that Kumail would say, one day, Ali and I walking, Dahar al-Kufa. He says, whilst we're walking, Midst of the nights, I hear beautiful Quran recitation. Beautiful. He says, as I'm passing by this house, I hear this recitation. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Amman huwa qanitun ana al-layl. He says, I hear this. He says, in my heart, in my heart, I thought to myself, how amazing must this personality be that he's reciting in the midst of the night when all eyes are closed, that he's up praying towards Allah, such a beautiful voice that he has. Surely, he must be of those people of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He says, in my head, I thought that. Within myself, I never said it. Now look at the flip side. He says, Amir looks towards me. He says, Ya Kumail, la yughirruka tantanata rajul. He says, I didn't say anything. In my heart. He says, Ali looks at me. Look at the words. He's reading Quran, but look at what Amir al says. He says, Do not allow the sound that is coming out of the tongue of this man impress you. You know, tantana, for those that know Arabic, tantana is used when an animal makes a sound that is unknown. So it makes no, doesn't have or doesn't hold any meaning to us. So Amir is saying to him, That sound has no value. Do not let it impress you. So he's like, you know, I know it's Amir al muminin I'm not going to question him. So I says, I left it. Left it. How he knew what was in my heart in the first place, I had no idea. But So he says, years went on. First civil war occurred. Battle of Jamal. 
Second civil war occurred, Battle of Safin. Third civil war occurred against the Khawarij. He would say, Kumail, come with me at the end of the battle. Kumail, come with me. So Kumail follows him. Ali ibn Talib says, he looks at me, he smiles, and he says, with a blood-drenched blood sword, he points to the ground, and he looks at me. And he says, Amman huwa qanitun ana al-layl. The same verse that I heard all those years ago in Kufa, it says that man that you were impressed with has just fought against us in Nahrawan. So it doesn't matter that you think he worships. You know who the Khawarij were? They used to have darkened foreheads, how much they were in prostration. They were the ones that known to have prayed Salatul Subh with the wudu of Maghrib and Isha from the previous day. They had worship, but it was just actions. There's no value in that worship. That's what we need to work on. That our actions, not necessarily focusing on the quantity of how much we do, but rather the quality, the heart that will be attached to those actions. In order for us to call ourselves of the companions of the Imam of our time, we want to look into how did the companions on the 10th of Muharram reply towards the cry of Abba Abdullah. How important is it? We're going to look at this by answering a few questions. The first question we want to answer is what's the meaning of wa'iyah? When we say wa'iyatul Hussein, what is the meaning of wa'iyah? Number one. Number two, when we understood what does wa'iyah mean? Number two, what is the danger? Why did Imam al Hussein warn people? against the wa'iyah of his. Number three, when did Imam al Hussein, when did Imam al Hussein say this particular line? Was it once that he said it? Or were there multiple occasions? Number four, what are the different understandings that come forward about why Imam al Hussein had to say that in the form that he did on the 10th of Muharram. And finally, is this particular wa'iyah of Aba Abdullah something that is general or is it specific? As in, is it specific towards Karbala? Or does it have a more general understanding that it expands beyond Karbala? And how does it apply towards our Imam? Now, inshallah, when we, ask, when we answer these five questions, we'll have an in-depth Reasoning of why this is important and how we can take it, apply it to our life and try to have it at the forefront when we want to be or strive to be companions of our Imam. So inshallah we can bless the majlis, start the lecture, illuminate our hearts and mind by reciting three times Salat ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. Can I ask everyone to come as much forward as possible as well please? Allahumma salli Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah Wa'iyah We often hear it on the manabir Wa'iyatul Hussein Wa'iyatul Hussein What does it mean? Wa'iyah The books of Linguistics will find Wa'iyah Wa'a Understandably, it is a scream that holds meaning. So when someone comes and says, as an example, when someone comes towards a grave and they begin to, in a loud voice, begin to mention that person speaking to them, merits, whatever have you, it's in a very elevated tone. They would say that this person is, in the way that they're speaking, Allocated to being a wa'iyah. So therefore, on the first level, when we say wa'iyatul Hussein, we don't say sarkhatul Hussein. Why? There's a big difference that we're going to get to. Because we can say sarkha in Arabic means scream of Aba Abdullah. But we say wa'iyatul Hussein. Why do we say wa'iyah? We'll get to it at the end. But the understanding now is that he has pieces of information, but in a very elevated voice. So now, 
We begin to understand where did he say it and why did he warn people from it? So many times we say someone's screaming, but if someone comes and warns you, he says, I'm going to scream, but make sure when I scream, you don't do this. It's giving us a context. Oh, Imam, what shouldn't we do if we hear you scream? Because there's, there's a warning that comes with this particular wa'iyah that we don't often pay heed to. As an example, the story that we had yesterday that we spoke about a person that didn't want to come towards Abba Abdullah, Abaydullah ibn al hurr al-Ju'fi. This personality, we said, is one of the people that fought against Amir al muminin Imam al Hussein, as he's passing, we said different stations towards Karbala. One of the stations, he sees this particular tent. When he sees the tent, he asks people, he says, who is that tent for? They say, that's the tent of Abaydullah ibn al-Hur. He says, call him towards me. So Imam's calling someone. He says, call him towards me. News reaches him. Hussein ibn Ali is calling upon you to come towards him. So he says, wallah, I've never left Kufa except that I do not cross paths with, with Imam al Hussein." With Hussein ibn Ali. That's the only reason I left Kufa. And now we're crossing paths. He says, I don't want to go. He says, Hussein ibn Ali is calling me. He says, I'm staying here. News reaches Imam al Hussein. He says, Don't worry, I'll go towards him. So he comes towards Abaydullah ibn Hur. And the dialogue that we discussed yesterday, he says, Would you come with us or not? He says, Oh, Hussein, I have too much love for this world. I'm too attached. Oh, Hussein, take my horse, take my sword. So Imam Hussein, after he is angered with him and tells him, what do I have? I'm offering you salvation and you want to give me materialistic things? What's the next word that he says to him that we need to pay heed to? He says, فَإِنْ لَا تَنْصُرُنَا فَاتَّقِ اللَّهِ أَنْ لَا تَكُمْ مِمَّنْ يُقَاتُلُنَا First precedent. He says, okay. You don't want to defend us. Seek refuge in Allah that you won't be of those that fight against us. Keep that in your mind. Because we're going to come back towards it. Don't be of those that fight against us. Fawallah la yasma'u By Allah. Ahadun thumma la yansirna illa halak. It says by Allah. Whomever he is our wa'iyah. Doesn't say my. Pay attention. He says our wa'iyah. Whomever he is our wa'iyah does not come towards our aid and defense, then halak means basically he's going to hellfire. Halak. One. First warning. Second warning, he says, in one of the other stations, he says he was stationed inside. Two people come in. Am ibn Qais al Mashriqi and his cousin. When they enter, they see Imam. Salamu alaykum as salam. Imam asks them, He says, Are you here to defend us? Tansuruni, you're going to here to defend us? Be by our side? Fight alongside us? So the tradition says that he started making excuses. You know, like, ah, you know, Imam, I'm on my way. I got kids. I got a business. I got things to deal with. I got stock that's coming in. Imam, I can't. So it's okay. I've given you an opportunity. But it says, Fella, testami'a li wa'iyah. Do not hear the wa'iyah from me. وَلَا تَرَى لِي سَوَادًا Meaning, do not hear my wa'iyah or see our shadow as an army. Make sure you're that far away that you do not hear my wa'iyah nor see the army's shadow when we fight. فَإِنَّهُ مَنْ سَمِعَ وَاعِيَتَنَا أَوْ رَأَى لِي سَوَادًا فَلَمْ يَجِبْنَا وَلَمْ, يغيث ولم يَغِثْنَا كَانَ حَقًّا عَلَى اللَّهِ أَنْ يَكِبُّ عَلَى مَنْ خَرَيْهِ بِالنَّارِ Now, he says, by Allah, if someone hears our wa'iyah or sees our shadow and doesn't come to our aid, it is encompassed upon Allah that He throws those people on their faces 
into hellfire. Second warning. Second warning. This common theme there is whomever hears our cry, our wa'iyah doesn't come. Sees our shadow now and doesn't come for our assistance, for our defense. Another person comes in the battle of Safin, he would say, that Amir al-Mu'mineen, when I was with him, I saw Amir al-Mu'mineen all of a sudden come off his horse, throw himself on the sands. He would take the sand, he would say, and he would smell the sand. When he would smell the sand, he said, I remember him saying particular lines. He says, Wahan lek ayyuhal turba. He says, glad tiding to you, O Turba, O you, or this clay. لَيَحْشُرَنَّ مِنْكَ قَوْمٌ يَدْخُلُونَ الْجَنَّ بِغَيْرِ حِسَابٍ On you will fall people that will enter into paradise without judgment. Without judgment. So he says, I remember... Amir al-Mu'mineen is saying this, and I went to tell my wife. He says, years went past, years went past, he says, until I was part of the army that was sent with Umar ibn Sa'ad against Hussein. He says, I saw in that position, remembering that this was the very land that Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib would fall on, smell the dust, and say those particular lines. So he says, at that moment, I remembered. So he says, I left the army, went towards Abu Abdullah. He says, Oh Hussein ibn Ali, I remember your father saying this particular lines. What should we do? What do they mean? He says, are you with us or against us? With us or against us? He says, I'm not really with you, nor am I against you. I'm very neutral in this perspective. He says, Famdi, then make sure you're far. Then he says, this day, there is no person that will be forgiven that he doesn't come to our assistance when he hears our wa'i. That was the day of Karbala. Now let's take that into perspective. When we take this into perspective, we understand that yes, now there's a warning. If you hear, if you see, if you know, and you do not defend, you do not assist, then Allah will make it encompassed upon Himself that He throws those people on their faces into hellfire. Now, when was it that Imam al Hussein has this wa'iya? So we understand there's a danger. When was the cry? It's an interesting question. When was this particular cry? One opinion comes forward and says, in the traditions, we understand that Imam al Hussein, when he stood by himself in Karbala, doesn't have any of his companions. Abbas has fallen. At that very moment, he cries out, Allah min Nasirin yansurna. That's the first one. This is at that very moment, some people will, would have moved and came towards his army, like those that we mentioned a few nights ago, the two brothers. They say, no, there was many moments within Karbala that Imam repetitively said, Allah min Nasirin yansurna. As an example, we have Wahab on the battlefield. The understanding of Wahab, newly wed, his mother would tell him, go and defend the grandson of Rasulullah. His wife would not let him. Back, forth, back, forth. Wahab goes towards the battlefield. When he goes towards the battlefield, he falls. When he falls, he looks back and he sees his wife coming onto the battlefield. Then he looks, Ya Amat Allah, did you not tell me do not go into the battle? Why is it that I see you moments ago telling me do not go and sacrifice yourself for this man? And now you are charging into battle against the enemies. What does she say in the traditions? Do not blame me, O Wahab. In the al Hussein, the wa'iya of Hussein has hurt my heart. Kasarat qalbi. The wa'iya, hearing the cry of Hussein, broke my heart. I could not contain myself. So we find different situations within Karbala. Imam al Hussein is repetitively saying, Allah min Nasrin, Allah min Nasrin. Is there no one? Is there no one? Why? 
Why does he repetitively say it? Why didn't he only say it once, twice? The first opinion comes forward and says that understandably Imam Hussein twice he lectured to them. Many times they could see right from wrong. Many of the companions themselves would go towards Abu Abdullah and ask permission to go and speak towards the enemies. So we see this. We see it and see it. Why does he repetitively cry out? The first opinion says because there were 30,000. He needed to scream in order for them to hear and they have no hujjah. Because once they hear, then the hujjah is cut. If they hear him saying it and they go against it, because what does he say? If someone hears us, listens and hears our wa'iyah, doesn't defend us, Allah will throw them into hell. So the first opinion says that because there were 30,000, he needed to scream in order for all of them to hear. The second comes forward and says that it was the absolute pinnacle of oppression towards man, mankind. As in when you look towards the tragedy of Karbala, saying that you've just seen atrocities that you'll never see in your life. And you are performing that atrocities with the sword that we have given you. We've taken you from ignorance towards the light of Islam. And that sword that we put into your hands, you're using it against the very prophet that revealed the message to you. It says the greatness of that oppression is not only did you kill him, but you killed the youngest of his, the oldest of his, and you've taken the ladies captive. It says the height of this oppression in Karbala, Imam al Hussein is screaming, is there no one amongst you? Is there no one amongst you? So you find this notion that the second level, they say that it's because of the absolute level of oppression that occurred. The third, which is rejected, they say that opinion is there that Imam al Hussein was saying it out of mercy, meaning that he was saying it because he wanted assistance, because he was weak. No. They say he was crying out for help. He says, no. He doesn't cry out saying, you know, I am thirsty and I'll allow me to go back. Please leave me or help me with a bit of water. I cannot survive. He says, you have an opportunity. He makes it very clear that that cry of mine is giving you an opportunity to come and defend Islam. An opportunity like that of Hors to leave hellfire and come into the gardens of heaven. And he made it encompassed again and again and again that this message is solely for the longevity of Islam, solely for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's the reason for this cry. Now the question now is, is this cry, cry specific for Karbala or is it general? Meaning when Imam al Hussein says these words, Is there no one to defend us? Is there no one to protect? The family of Rasulullah, is it specific to Karbala or is it everlasting and occurs through time? It's a very interesting question. Had he says, had he said, Alam min Nasrin Yansuruna fi Karbala would be specific, wouldn't it? Imam Hussain doesn't say that. Allah min Nasrin Yansuruna. Is there no one to assist us? Isn't there no one to defend the family of Rasulullah? Is there no one to use that which he has to defend the message, to protect the message, to safeguard the message? It says if we were to take that in its general scope, one of the notions is from our Imam, Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib. Allahumma salli. If you can come a little bit closer, brothers, my apologies. Sallu ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. Allah. Mad wa. He would say, is, if there is anyone that he is our wa'iyah, collective, our wa'iyah, or sees us in battle and does not defend us 
and protect their message. Again, the same words. Then Allah has made it encompassed upon Himself to throw them on their face in hellfire. Now understanding these two parameters, bringing them together, we see that this particular logic that Imam Hussein uses is not specific to Karbala. Not specific. In a ziyarah for Imam al-Sadiq, in Kamil ziyarat, Allahumma salli ala Muhammad. Look at what he says when someone asks him, what should you say when you hear these words? This word of a wa'iyah from Abba Abdullah. In the ziyarah he says, in kana lam yajibka badani. If my body wasn't present there to defend you, O Abba Abdullah. I wasn't there. If my body wasn't there to defend you, Ya Abba Abdullah, فَقَدْ أَجَابَكَ قَلْبِي My heart will respond towards you. وَشَعْرِي My hair. وَبَشَرِي وَرَأِي My thoughts. وَهَوَاي My desire. عَلَى التَّسْلِيمِ لِخَلَفِ النَّبِيِّ الْمُرْسَلِ He says, if I wasn't there in my physical being, I have heard your wa'iya. I will ensure that I will forever in my life be there in heart and mind. That same principles that you died for, there will be an imam that defends that same principle. An imam will come with the same message. Ya litharat al Hussein. We find this particular notion when imam comes and we want to be of his companions. Many of us, we found ourselves in situations when we asked, will you be of those that defend the Imam or be against the Imam? I mean, all of us will come forward and say, how, how can you even think that we'll be of those people that goes against the Imam? The Imam's going to come with a banner. That banner, Ya Li Tharatul Hussein, is against everything that stood against the principles of Imam Al Hussein. That banner, is going to be against those that oppress. We need to look unto ourselves. When we ask the questions, are we going to be with the Imam or against the Imam? Imam with that banner is fighting against oppression. Have I oppressed? Have I oppressed Allah in shirk? Have I oppressed myself with worship? Have I oppressed others? Different forms of oppression. He's going to come against oppression. He's going to come against moral deficits and vices is going to come against those that lie those that cheat those that are disloyal do you have any of those qualities he's going to establish the same principles he's going to look at you saying i'm going to be against those that disrespect and dishonor their parents are you of those any vice you pick and choose. Imam comes. He's going to oppose those vices. Why? Because he's coming forward with the same principles that Imam al Hussein called out for all those years ago. What are we going to do? When we put ourselves in that situation, we hear the wa'i of Abba Abdullah. From the pulpits now, you can hear it. We read it. We say, Ya laytana kunna ma'akum. We wish that we were alongside you, that we are able to sacrifice ourselves to gain the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Nafuza fawzan azima. We have another opportunity. We can, if we take that cry of Abba Abdullah, apply it to our lives, be of the companions of our Imam, we have the ability. But how many of us actually place it within our lives? How many of us will finish these 10 nights and go right back to what we used to do? Right back to all those things that we promised about Abdullah will never return back to. And how many of us will actually allow that spark of love between us and Abba Abdullah to remain ignited till the next Muharram? How many of us? How many of us say, oh Abbas, your flag never fell. We will raise it for you. How many of us, if we understand the value of when Imam al Hussein tells us, whomever hears this and does not come to our aid, 
We're hearing it. Let's look at our life. If there's anything within our life that you think to yourself, if Imam looks towards that thing, he will not be impressed. Remove it from your life. Move from that place. Move from that person. Move from that action. Many in Karbala heard the cry and didn't respond. Many heard the cry and didn't respond. And there are those that came, Labbaik ya Aba Abdullah. Of them was Ali al Akbar. Of them was Qasim. Of them was Habib. Of them was Muslim. Of them was Wahab and his wife. But Imam al Hussein was there in moments in Karbala. As Fatima would be told, in a position where his father was not there, his mother Fatima was not there, his brother Hassan was not there, and a moment where Abbas wasn't there anymore. A moment in Karbala. Hussein looks around, no one beside him. Looks around, all his companions lay on the plains of Karbala. Two hands and an arrow by the river. Then he begins to cry the famous cry, Allah min nasrin yansuruna. Is there no one to assist us? Is there no one to come and protect the family of Rasulullah? I want you to imagine what would a baby six month Ali Azgar do when he hears this. They would say when Sajjad would hear this, he would say, Oh my auntie, give me a sword and a stick. Why, oh Sajjad? He says, I cannot bear hearing the cry of my father Hussein. The sword is to defend Aba Abdullah, and that stick is to help me stand, oh my auntie Zainab. He goes past the tents, he sees the ladies crying, he would hear the children screaming, Al Atash, Al Atash, Ya Aba Abdullah, the thirst, three days we have not drank any water, oh Aba Abdullah, we are thirsty. When he enters one of the tents, his eyes goes on to the eyes of Ali al Azgar. His mother Abab would look towards Aba Abdullah saying, Oh Hussein, I do not have any milk left in me. That Ali al Azgar is struggling to breathe. Oh Aba Abdullah, is there a chance you can get water for him? You know what the tradition says? He says when he looks towards Ali and Al Asghar, the tradition says, Kana yatalavva atashan. You know what yatalavva means? Yatalavva, just to give you a description. You know when you take a fish out of water, how it's struggling? He says, Ali Asghar was struggling in that manner, in that very moment. No milk, no water, gasping for air, trying to get some sort of satisfaction. Aba Abdullah, what heart did Aba Abdullah have looking upon this six month old in such a state? He would take Ali Asghar and go towards the enemies. They would say, Imam al Hussein, when he'd go towards Karbala, when he's fighting, he'd ride on a horse towards the battlefield. When he's going to lecture them, he would go on a camel towards the enemies. But then they said, we saw Hussein very differently than we see Hussein before. We saw him walking barefoot on the plains of Karbala. He said, but we saw that Hussein had something under his clothes that he protected from the heat of the sun as he's walking on the sands in Karbala towards the enemies. They would say, we saw Aba Abdullah all of a sudden stop in his tracks, look towards us, open his clothes and reveal to us a baby. And he would say, oh enemies of Allah, if there is a sinful 
are the adults. What sin has this six month old uh, performed? The armies would look, they would see a six month old in the hands of Abba Abdullah. He would say, just feed him a little bit of water so he survives. Look at how he's struggling to breathe. Look at how small he is. Look at how the sun has affected his blessed body. He says, if you are afraid to give me access to water that you think that I may drink, then let me leave him on the hot desert sand. You come and take my baby. Take my baby. You give him water. They would say the army is seeing Hussein in such a state. Half of the army would say, Indeed, why is it that we're not giving a, a sip of water towards a six month old? Why do we not give him quench that six month old thirst? Why? The other end of the army would say, Do not leave from this holy family even a six month old. Do not leave even this child from Al Muhammad. Kill them all. They'll begin to disagree amongst themselves. Hussein is holding a six month old Omar ibn Sa'ad looks towards Harmala he says Harmala I fear that the army will become disunited I need you to end this problem between them he would say what would you have me do oh Omar he would say kill them oh Harmala Harmala would bring not any arrow he would bring a three pointed arrow the ones that are used to kill the camels when Mukhtar catches Harmala, he says, Harmala, what did you do on the 10th of Muharram? Of the calamities that we know of. He says, of the arrows that I shot, many of them did not strike their targets. But there were three that struck targets that hurt about Abdullah al Hussein. He would say to him, Oh Harmala, which ones of your arrows that you struck hurt the heart of Abba Abdullah? He would say there were three in Karbala that hurt Abba Abdullah. He would say the first one that I struck landed in the eyes of Abba Fadl Abbas. He said that he was in such pain that he could not remove it because he didn't have hands to remove the arrow from his eye. He says, that's the first. What's the second arrow that you struck? He said, the second arrow that I struck, struck the heart of Abba Abdullah. He would say, I knew that one hurt Hussein. He would say, how? They would say that every time he tried to remove it from his chest, he was not able to. It was stuck that he had to remove the arrow from his back. The blood of his heart would gush everywhere. He would say that hurt him. He says, but there's one that hurt me. Which one was it? He says, the one that I, when I placed it and I struck and I saw Hussein holding a six month old towards the heavens. He says, when that arrow struck, it doesn't strike Hussein. He says, it struck the delicate neck of a six month old baby. I ask you, how small is a neck of a six month old? And what did it leave from the head that was attached if it was three pointed arrow? They would say, while Abba Abdullah would hold Ali al Azgar. You can imagine when you look in the eyes of your child, you can see pain in the eyes of your child. But that pain couldn't be from something that hurt them. A scratch when they fall. That in itself, those eyes kill you. Imagine if your child looks at you when his head is barely on his body. They would say that Ali Asghar was in such pain. Doesn't know where the pain is coming from. He would flap his hands, flap his legs like a bird in pain. He would say, Hussein, my father, I'm in pain. Hussein, help me, father. They would say the final act of Ali Asghar flaps his hands until he holds the neck of Abba Abdullah. He dies on the neck of Hussein. Hussein is in a dilemma now. He's holding Ali Asghar. He's thinking, how can I bring a six month old back to the tent? 
Oh, Mu'mineen is there in Karbala, standing in the heat of Karbala, saying, shall I bury him right here? Should I return to the tents? What should I do? He stands for moments. He decides to return towards the tents. When he returns, he places Ali Asghar under his garments. He would say, how do I show them? Ali Asghar in such a state, he's going left and right, not entering the tent, left and right, holding Ali Asghar, what do I do? All of a sudden, who comes to him? A young Sakina would come, Father Hussein, I do not hear the cry of Ali Asghar. Have they fed him water? Surely that's why that I do not hear his cry. Surely he has quenched his thirst. Sakina has quenched it not from water. He's quenched it through his blood. Hussein would remove the garments and he would take his her baby brother. She would look at Ali Azra and would say, Father Hussein, what are you showing me, Hussein? Remove the baby from me. He would say, Sukaina, there's only one heart that can handle this. Call me Zayna. How did Zaynab take him? How did she tell Rabab? They say Hussein only buried one person on the 10th of Muharram. They would say Hussein would go around his tents. How small is a six month old? How small is the grave of a six month old? They would say Hussein would remove with the edge of his sword a little bit of the sand of Karbala. I want you to imagine the heart of Abba Abdullah placing a six month old under the heat in the desert of Karbala. How did he place Azgar in that sand? How did he, in his abilities, in that heart of mercy and rahmah, able to take the sand and place it on the face of Ali ibn al -Azgar. How, oh Abba Abdullah, were you able to not look towards him when you placed the sand on his body? They would say after, after Karbala, look at the tragedy. The poet paints a beautiful picture of how barbaric the army of Umar ibn Sa'ad was. They would say after they trampled the body of Abba Abdullah, they would place the body from one side to another in Karbala. The remains of your Imam, they would say they're about to leave Karbala. Many of them would begin to leave. There was one group of people that did not leave Karbala. They would say, oh Omar, we are not leaving. Why? They would say, oh Omar, everyone has a head on a spear. But we do not have a head on a spear. Omar would look around. I've already removed all the heads from the bodies. Is there any head that's left in Karbala? He says, I remember Hussein going around his tents with Azgar. They would say Omar ibn Sa'ad would go behind the tents looking for a six month old. But he wasn't digging up with his hands. You know what he used to do? He took a spear. He'd begin to take the spear and place it into the ground in Karbala. Lift it. Nothing comes up again. He would place the spear. Take it up. Nothing. Until he struck with the spear the body of Ali ibn al -Azgar. He would raise the spear, take the body, and what remains from the head on the body, that the three-pointed arrow remains, he would take how would you remove a six-month-old's head from his body? How can you place that tiny head, the beautiful head of Ali al-Azhar? How did you place it on the spear?